Hey everybody, Mr. J here. So I'm using AI on my camera to actually see through me so you can only see my bones and my joints. So throughout the rest of this class, I'm just going to be a skeleton. <laughs> if you believe me, for even a second, I'm going to be laughing at you for the remainder of uh, the time that you watch Organized Biology. So, hey everybody, Mr. J here. Today we're talking about joints, and joints are very, very simple, to be honest. Joints are simply where two bones come together. So two bones come together, and that is a joint. Now, clearly, if you look, you have 206 bones in your body. That's a lot of them. So therefore, there's a lot of places where these bones are kind of coming together, right? So we need a way to classify these so we can understand how they look as well as how they function, anatomy and physiology. So we're going to start first with something called fibrous joints, move on to cartilaginous very quickly, and then spend most of the time on things called synovial joints because they're the most common and the most fun because they move a lot. So let's get rolling. So first off, fibrous joints. Fibrous joints are where two or more bones are coming together, but there's only ligaments found between them. So we're only finding ligaments, that dense regular connective tissue. So that's forming basically a weld between the two bones. So they're really not going to move virtually at all. So where are places in your body where two bones are kind of welded together? Well, you may have talked about in another class or my class about the sutures of the skull where you've got, say, the occipital bone, the parietal bone sutured together, and that is a fibrous joint because the only thing found there is basically ligaments, sutural ligaments. So I've drawn that up here. These are your sutures as an example, but we also have your radius and your ulna connected to each other. Now, if you look at the radius and the ulna, in retrospect to each other, they don't move. So these two bones really don't move in uh, retrospect to each other because there's a bunch of ligaments connecting the two right here, okay? So that is called a syndesmosis fibrous joint. So syndesmosis, big long word, basically meaning it's together and strong. Now the last one, you may see this before, these are your teeth, and then you've got either the mandible or the maxilla that your teeth are embedded into. They're kind of pegged into those bones. And they're connected to the bones and the teeth by things called periodontal ligaments. So I'm gonna write that, periodontal ligaments. Now why periodontal? Well, peri means around, dont refers to teeth, so it's around the teeth ligaments, and the only thing found between them are ligaments. So therefore, they are fibrous joints. Now, these have a fun name. These are called gomphosis joints, gomphosis joints. And I just remember like gom, gom, gom. It kind of sounds like you're chewing, right? So these are your uh, basically teeth ligaments connecting to the bones of your skull. Now, fibrous joints, obviously, um, those are my examples, by the way. I put them in the wrong spot. But fibrous joints really don't move. They're not very interesting. We don't talk about them all that much because there are more complex joints. So next up, we've got cartilaginous joints. Now, obviously, within the name, you can kind of infer what is inside of it, just as you inferred that fibrous has like these fibers of ligaments. So cartilaginous obviously have only cartilage between the two bones, but they also may have some ligaments as well, just depends on the part of the body. Now, if we only have cartilage and ligaments, they're still going to be pretty much welded together really closely, but they might move a little bit. Okay, so let me give you three areas of your body where you may have these cartilaginous joints. First off, if you look at Mr. Skeleton here, we've got ribs connected to the sternum, and we've got this kind of like plastic looking color here. These are your costal cartilages or your rib cartilages. And so this bone, when it comes together with this bone, is connected only by cartilage. Now, does that move very much? Not really, because obviously, like your, your ribs can expand and contract, but they're not going to move all that much when they're connected to that cartilage. So we can say that some of them are going to be those hyaline cartilage joints, where there's just hyaline, hyaline cartilage between the ribs and the sternum connecting the two. However, we may have places where the cartilage is actually fibrocartilage. Now, where is there fibrocartilage found between two bones? Several places. 
we've got your intervertebral discs right here. Let's see if I can move it closer. So all of these are fibrocartilage pads between the vertebrae. You'll also have some in the pubic symphysis where the two pubic bones are coming together. And you'll also have some in the meniscus of the knee. So between, it's not shown here, but the femur and the tibia, you'll have the meniscus padding, fibrocartilage that's considered technically a cartilaginous joint because the only thing kind of found between those two bones in that specific area are cartilage. Okay, brilliant. So those are the main cartilaginous joints. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the details of them again, but again, they're kind of for a little more protection and then a little more padding. And why do they move a little bit? Because they're slightly malleable. Now on to the synovial joints. Synovial joints, I drew a little structure over here because I want you to see all the things that are associated inside of a synovial joint. We have, I have in dotted lines here, we've got ligaments. Okay, so one thing we have are ligaments. We'll also have cartilage padding, basically capping off the bones. So we've got ligaments and cartilage. Well, then why aren't they fibrous or cartilaginous joints? Well, because inside of the space between the bones, we have something called synovial fluid. This is the key indicator of whether or not it's a synovial joint. So what we can, we can write over here is it can contain synovial fluid as well as ligaments and cartilage. And it usually has all three. In fact, it always has all three, I'll be completely honest. So those are your answers to those blanks there. Now, I want you to know that these are highly movable. Why? Because of that synovial fluid. I want you to think of the synovial fluid as like the WD-40 or the grease for your joints. It allows these bones, this one and this one, to glide across each other virtually with no friction. That allows a lot of movement of these joints, which is why anytime you really move, you are using a synovial joint. Now, one other structure inside the synovial joint is this fibrous capsule I drew in red, fibrous capsule of uh, connective tissue. And that's going to basically house that synovial fluid, keep it properly in place, essentially, so that it doesn't get out, and, because you don't want to lose synovial fluid. You don't want to lose that grease. Wonderful. So there are six main types of synovial joints, and I've drawn kind of what they look like on here because the joint structure and function are going to be very correlated. So let's just move through one by one. I'm not going to write the examples on the board. I'm actually going to show you them on the skeleton. So let's start with the first one. We've got a bone here, like a cylinder bone, and then a plain bone, and all that is going to do is going to glide across itself, glide across itself. So this is called a plain joint because it's really moving or acting on a plane. Now, where do we have plane joints? Well, enter in your carpals. So these are the wrist bones right here. And as you can see, as you move your hand about, these bones can ever so slightly just shift across each other. So all these carpals right here, shifting across each other, those are all plane joints. They don't move much, but they move enough because they've got synovial fluid in between them all. So if you've ever like, for example, moved your wrist and you feel that pop or, some cr or you hear some cracking, it's actually the synovial fluid kind of moving back and forth. You also have some plane joints in your vertebrae, specifically between the articular, uh, the spinous process and the articular processes of the other ones. As they're gliding across each other, say you're turning your back, all of those vertebrae are turning like this. That is a plane joint because it's just moving on one plane. Brilliant. So the plane joint's kind of interesting, but they really don't move all that much, but they're synovial because they've got that fluid and they're slightly movable. Now, next up, we've got the hinge joint. So right here, we're going to say this is the hinge joint. Now, you've probably heard of that before, door hinge. A door hinge opens up like this. So the movement of a hinge joint is going to be basically, you've got this like rounded edge, and it's going to turn on a hinge as such. And as I'm demonstrating that, I'm showing you one right here, right? So your cubital region, your elbow region, acts as a hinge joint. Another hinge joint would be your phalanges. You see how your phalanges kind of open and close like this? Exactly the same as a door. Your jaw will also be kind of like a hinge because you're opening jaw, closing jaw. And the same thing is equal and opposite in your legs. So your knee is a hinge joint as well as your uh, phalanges of your feet. All right, brilliant. And that's just a few examples. You have several hinge joints. All right, so it's kind of like in a one matter of direction, but just like in door hinge. 
Now, thirdly, this one's kind of interesting. This is called a saddle synovial joint. And you can probably predict why we called it that. It almost looks like a horse's saddle sitting on top of its back, right? That's kind of what it was named after. So you've kind of got this thin peg inside a little rounded depression. Now these are very rare. There's actually only two in your body. So I'm gonna show you where those are at. At the base of your thumb, so where your metacarpal reaches your scaphoid bone, this is actually a saddle joint. So what can a saddle joint do? I want you to take your thumb and I want you to keep it straight and move it left and right, and then move it forward and back. You see how you can kind of make a slight cone movement with your thumb? That's because a saddle joint has a little more range of motion than a hinge joint. Remember the hinge joint is basically just up, down, up, down. But now you can move side to side and make that little cone shape, okay? So that's one place you've got the saddle joint, base of the thumb. You also have a saddle joint between your sternum, okay, as well as your clavicle. So where your clavicle meets your sternum, I'll show you here on Mr. Skelly. This one's actually really nice. You can actually see it. So you see this depression in the sternum, the maneuverum, the top part. And then you've got that little uh, projection off the clavicle sitting inside of it, just like a horse's saddle. And again, what's the movement? Exactly like your thumb. So I want you to basically move your shoulders up and down like this, as well as forward and back exactly the same as your thumb. Kind of cool, right? So as you can see, I'm kind of moving my way up to more and more movement, all right? So the plane joint, very little. Hinge joint, pretty good, but just in one direction. Saddle joint, where you can kind of move in a couple directions. All right, now we're gonna pivot <laughs> a little bit and go to the pivot joint. Now pivot joint is gonna be a completely different type of motion entirely. We see this little peg bone spinning inside of a groove, okay? So we got a peg spinning inside of a groove, so it's a very circular type of motion. Couple pivot joint areas I want you to know, and this you're gonna hate me for this, but if you remember back in like 2010, one of the songs was like really popular, it was like the whip and the nay nay, right? So when you whipped, you basically take your wrist and you turn it over, right? That was probably the best whip you've ever seen in your life. Uh, well, when you're doing that, you're actually having your radius spin inside of the groove of your humerus. Let me show you on this guy. So you see the radius here, okay, a little rounded groove. Here's the humerus. When the radius spins like a pivot, it actually turns that wrist over, you see that? So that is a pivot joint. And you also have a pivot joint in the top of your skull between the axis, C2, and atlas. You see how his, he can shake his head no? It's kind of off on this skeleton. There we go. So you see how you can shake your head no? And that C1 is basically spinning on the groove of C2. So I always remember the world turns on its axis, which is cervical vertebrae number two, and then your atlas is number one. Brilliant. So if you shake your head no, that's also a pivot joint, as well as uh, you're whipping and nay-naying, right? Uh, so you can always remember, like, if you whip, you're likely going to shake your head at Mr. Jackson. Those are both pivot joints. Brilliant. Okay, number five. This is going to be called, it's got a couple names. I'm going to call it the condylar joint. Condylar joint. All right, and this is similar in structure to the saddle joint where we kind of have a, a groove and then something sitting inside of it, but this is more rounded, okay? A condylar joint is more rounded and that allows for a lot more motion than the uh, saddle joint. So think about it, take your thumb and kind of make a circle. You can kind of make a good sized circle, but then I want you to take your pointer finger and make a circle with it. You can make a much bigger circle with the rest of your phalanges because those all have a condylar joint where those metacarpals meet your phalanges. So here's your uh, metacarpals right here, and here's a phalange. There's a condylar joint right there on all four of them. And then once again, the base of the thumb is a saddle joint. So you've got the condylar joint there. The same thing goes between your uh, radius and ulna and your wrist. You see how you can make a big circle with your wrist? You can also make a big circle with your ankle. So if I pull, pull this guy's ankle up, if you can see it, you can make basically a nice circle. That is also a condylar joint. So remember, condylar cone. You can make a big cone-like circle with those movements. Brilliant. Last one, my favorite, the ball and socket joint. This is number six, ball and socket. As you can guess, it's a big ball and a big socket, and there are two main parts in your body. One is 
your glenohumoral joint, the glenoid cavity of the scapula, your humerus, and you can make a big old circle, right? So the ball and socket joint is basically when you're moving your arm, you can move in all planes of direction, virtually, uh, <laughs> it can move anywhere. And then lastly, you've got your uh, acetab femoroacetabular joint, where your femur, this big bone in your leg, fits inside your acetabulum, the socket, and again, you can rotate your hip in a lot of different directions. So very, very movable joint. So if I were to ask on a test, hey, what's the most movable joint? Ball and socket, what's the least movable joint? Likely the plane joint. And these guys all kind of fall in the middle. So this is an overview of joints. Obviously there's a lot more that I did not mention because we got 206 bones, but I hope this was helpful. Gives you an overview. Thanks for watching.